everyone, this is Riz Ahmed, Chief Research Officer here at SAP Insider, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Don Loden and John Livingood, both Managing Directors at ProTivity. Gentlemen, welcome to the conversation, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Riz. Always a pleasure. Awesome. Well, I know our topic is, is the cloud and almost the Cloud Balancing Act, but let's start with each of you telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, what you do, what your passions are all about. And, and Don, let's start with you. Sure, sure thing. So my name, my name is Don Loden, I'm Managing Director with Protivity. I'm actually out of our Atlanta office, but I'm not even really sure any of that matters because we're all virtual all the time for, yeah, I mean, for now and who knows how long. But uh, no, I, I've been working with data and data management topics, uh, data governance, basically all things data in the SAP space for a little over 20 years now. And uh, SAP Insider has always been a great partner. So I look forward to the conversation. I guess what gets me going is uh, helping organizations do really interesting and innovative things with data. Great. Thanks, Don. John, help, let's learn a little bit about you. Sure, thank you. Hi, everyone. This is John Livingood, Managing Director in Productivity's Technology Consulting Practice, and I focus uh, primarily on enterprise applications and data, and, and I'm also Productivity's SAP Security and GRC Leader. Uh, Riz, in terms of your question around passions, I just overall I'm a technology enthusiast as a consumer and uh, you know really big on home automation, those types of things. And with my latest uh, acquisition of, a, of an e-bike, and the automation that it gives me for extra power needed to climb steep hills uh, has been my latest, uh, my my latest little side project here, and and so just leveraging these passions as a platform to help large companies run their business better through technology and automation has you know, really been a, a you know a way to bridge that uh, personal passion into the work world. So I look forward to the conversation. Yeah, that's great. Technology really seeps into all aspects of our lives now, right? You know, it's not just about uh, work. It's about exercise, gaming, and pretty much everything that you do. So uh, it's good to have passions that encompass all of that. Let's start with with talking about the cloud, right? You know, and the cloud is such a fuzzy general word. I know, I know it can mean a, a lot of different things, but for our intents and purposes, this is the SAP audience. They're, they're working and running their businesses um, you know, on, on applications such as SAP, and they're using the cloud for some real uh, important, heady stuff. What are you guys seeing in Protivity? You guys work with a lot of different clients. What are some of the momentum areas of cloud? You hear about Rise, you hear about S4, you hear about all these different things, but can you both just share your own perspectives on this? Sure, I mean, I can start. I I think that, you know, I think and I know in a lot of conversations where we start conversations around cloud, many organizations look at it purely from a cost perspective and they think about big iron, they think about racking and stacking hardware and they think about, you know, challenges, delays that that bring to projects. I mean, it, and it happens, it's, you know, we're in consulting, so we, you know, we've got tight timelines and all that kind of stuff. All those things are, are, are true and they're valid, right? But I feel like, uh, Clients are starting to really understand and think more about capabilities within an organization and thinking about things where, you know, you might have wanted to have a predictive capability or an AI capability or looking at computer vision or things like that. But frankly, it's not really easy or feasible to add, you know, a room full of data scientists. If you can find them, can you keep them? If you can keep them, how much you're gonna have to pay them, you know, and, and you know, folks that actually make Hadoop clusters actually work and all that type of stuff. So from an infrastructure and personnel perspective, it's really tough. So a lot of topics that were just interesting uh, boardroom conversations or initial conversations of, I wonder what would happen if we did this, usually stop at those conversations because it's either too cost prohibitive or just frankly not possible or impossible, you know, in the current environment. So with cloud, you can spin up a lot of things very cheaply, easily. You know, I was talking to a colleague uh, just this just this week who was saying, you know, just to see what performance was would look like, I essentially spun up what would have been nine different servers with like 150 CPUs or something like that, you know, for the tune of like 200 bucks just to see what would happen, you know, like literally rather than, you know, taking a week's worth of tuning and that type of thing. And those are just examples of like, you know, awesome stuff that was never possible before. Right. The ability to try and try stuff out is, is, is there. And as you, your example just 
show at not a big cost or yeah. a large time suck. So you're yeah. able to do, to do things like that. The what and if. you can throw it away so, if you hate it. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's great. John, what, what about your take on, on this? What do, you, what do you think the cloud has meant to some of the customers you're talking about? Too? You know, it's it's everyone's talking about in, in moving towards cloud, if nothing else, just to be able to compete. And in the end, it's really to simplify their support organization, you know, when moving to cloud. And so, you know, I, I would just add that it's important to distinguish between the different clouds. And so there's really several ways to look at cloud. There's the public cloud, uh, which you know, some folks call multi-tenant and there's other acronyms for, for these as well, right? And there's private cloud as well, this, the also known as single pendant, right? And, and the services that are managed by the cloud vendor as you go towards your cloud journey. And so it's, it's really important to understand uh, those differences and what your responsibilities are as a company uh, depending on the route of cloud environment you're heading towards. And so I see, in my view of today's world, I see most companies are already on cloud or some type of a hybrid environment or uh, heading in that direction with an uptrend momentum clearly heading towards public cloud. Yeah, no, and, and I, our research shows exactly what you're talking about, John, is that you know, 95, 98% are doing something with the cloud, you know, running SAP workloads. And we have some research coming out this later this month on, on that. So everybody is in the middle of doing it. It's, it's a question of what combination to your point and both opportunities and risk. Um, Don, I want to build on a little bit more of what you were talking about in terms of um, the art of the possible. And we hear this yeah. term and I talk to CIOs all the time and we hear this term innovation, right? I want to be able to innovate. I want to be able to create new, whatever, work ser servers, uh, new applications, new experiences. Uh, can we talk a little bit about and share more about how does the cloud really open up innovation? What impact does the cloud have on innovation in the in the customers you're talking in your experiences? Yeah, that's no, it's a great one, Riz. And I. And a lot of times people will jump to flashy examples of, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and like, you know, all the predictive stuff. Those are easy things to pick on. And frankly, you know, whether you're SAP or Microsoft or AWS, you know, everybody kind of leads with that because it's, you know, it's, it's really, it's really interesting and flashy. But I mean, if I'm thinking about SAP, uh, you know, and your, your typical SAP shop and SAP customers and folks that run FICO on SAP, they still have a heck of a hard time figuring out stuff like, you know, hey, I'm going to close the books this month in FICO and I'm running, you know, huge accruals. What's behind this, you know, you know, $5 million, not, probably not travel accrual these days, but basically like in the old days when like travel was happening, we'd be doing this in person, you know, sitting across the table, you know, maybe there's a, you know, five or if you're a large organization, a $10 million accrual that I'm running on the books, you know, based off of travel and expenses and things like that. And getting to that information and figuring out like literally what are all the what are all the you know the, the costs from the expense system whether you're running concur or not right uh, but but basically what is what's making up that spend and what you know is there something we can do about it is there something we should be doing about it um, we you know if you're talking about art of the possible you know we took an example for a client where we spun up a quick instance in Hana you know, basically took the, the GL data kind of for one side of it, and we took the transactions that make it up to say, well, what would happen if you could actually answer that question and answer it in a repeatable way rather than yanking the data out of the SAP systems, you know, and having an analyst spend, you know, three, three to five days putting that information together to get you an answer that you asked about on a Monday morning meeting, right, to get the answer from, you know, and what if you could actually get that answer hit a button and get it in the course of the meeting and then start to talk about ways to be actionable about it, right? So I think when we, we, we talked about, well, what if we made that possible and what if we could spin it up in a couple of weeks and that type of thing, and we did that and brought it back to the client just in a quick pilot type solution, you know, what it really, I guess the thing that really became evident or like how did it impact the organization is the finance leadership started to think, wow, I'm gonna have to start asking harder questions. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm really going to not say, well, is this possible? And then put a period on it and then, you know, get a few days to come back with it, but really start to think about, all right, what happens if this, or what about this? And like, really start to be able to dig into things. And I think what cloud really brings from possibilities or art of the possible is it's a mindset shift rather than just looking at, 
what's the question I have of today? It's really starting to think about, okay, I'm going to assume just like I assume with my, you know, pick up the phone, but I don't want to like do one phone or another or whatever, but just for the phone, for an example, you know, I go in there and download an app. I don't wonder if the app's going to download. It just is. But I wonder what I'm going to do with the app, right? That's a difference in thinking on a personal level, you know, for personal technology. Organizations should be like that too. And if you're an organization that thinks like that, you're well poised to eat other folks' lunch, to be honest with you. So that, that was great. We're talking about the, sort of the innovation and the art of the possible. But, you know, conversely, there are threats and risks associated with the cloud. And we hear them, uh, whether they're security, performance, oh, I don't want someone else managing this stuff for me. You know, there's data privacy law. Tell us a little bit about what are some of the, the real threats and risks that you work with your clients to mitigate when it comes to cloud? Yep, so I'll take that one. And, and so we see it you know, really across the board. And so, you know, if you look at the news lately and hear about some of the hot ones of ransomware as an example, right? And, you know, understanding from a cloud environment perspective, what are the threats as it relates to ransomware. And, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of the times it comes down to the internal and external access that one has to the environment, right? As just one simple example, it really boils down to, as you move to the cloud is understanding how it fits across, you know, your enterprise risks and threats. So be it compliance risks, right? And understanding, okay, what are the regulatory legal requirements that you need to consider? What are the contractual liability, financial compliance uh, requirements that need to be addressed as an example? And then you look at your financial and tax related risks, right? So things like credit risks, managing profitability, and does that have an impact as you move to the cloud? And things as simple as political risks as well, right? So if there's civil unrest war where your cloud hosting environment is, right? What does that have an impact to your business environment. So you have to you know, consider uh, potentially that from a political perspective, operational as well, right? So from a personal perspective, business continuity perspective, and many other things, how is that impacted by moving towards the cloud? And, you know, even you know, very importantly as well, probably arguably the most important is, you know, what is the impact from your strategic business strategic initiatives, right? So from whether it be your technology, your products, IP protection, acquisitions, depending on where you are, right? So really looking across your enterprise risk and threats and understanding how cloud fits into those. And I mentioned earlier the importance of understanding the company's responsibilities in a cloud environment because everything doesn't just simply fall on the vendor in, I would say, 100% of the cases, right? And so it's very easy to think that, um, you know, things that, you know, managing, monitoring the network and database uh, security as one example that, you know, typically could be something that the cloud vendor does uh, as one example, system uptime and availability, ensuring that there's monitoring around system uptime and availability that could be, uh, that, that would typically be done by the vendor, the cloud vendor itself, right? But, you know, things like, granting access to your environment, right? That's the customer has an onus on that. Understanding what the change management process is as you introduce new solutions and products into the cloud environment and ensuring that you follow those controls from a change management perspective. You know, the, the company has to be involved in that process, right? And, and there's a number of other uh, uh, parameters that need to be clearly aligned on what those roles and responsibilities are as you consider moving to cloud to address these risks. Because there are there are risks, uh, as one would expect, moving to the cloud, uh, just like anything else. Yeah, John, you, you, it was interesting. You were talking about, you know, it's it's the responsibilities are still there. It's just a question of who has them. And as you were set talking, it was so you kind of have to have within your organization, a way to almost check and balance that, that vendor and, and, and to be able to see into that availability and uptime. And, and so is that, that extra layer, I think is something that you, you got to have in place, right? Is, is that kind of what you're saying there? Yeah, it's, it, you know, listen, it's, for me, innovation always has to be in the forefront, right? Because that's how you're going to differentiate. That's what's going to get you excited to wake up in the morning, right? But there's got to be 
to your point, a right balance of doing things the right way, right? And uh, and so, uh, you know, what, what what can help with that is is ensuring that there's proper targets being measured for your organization as it relates to those risks and security threats, right? And so, if you really understand. And it's going to be different based off the company because of the products you have, the industry that you're in, the stage of company that you are, whether you're public, private, et cetera, right? But those targets uh, and striking the balance between innovation and uh, security and those managing those threats is going to be different by company. But if you're able to establish those targets or key performance indicators, to help you steer what's, you know, first off, what are the right targets for you as a company, right? But then, you know, help you measure those as you move towards the cloud and, and, and uh, uh, you know, run your operations on cloud is how do you ensure the right balance? What are the right targets for you to uh, ensure that there's the right balance? And then how are you measuring towards those? Can you give some examples, John, of, of targets, right? Because I think that's a, a nice example, you know, that set specific KPIs, but, and I know each company is going to be different, but give us some examples of, of targets that, that people would set or, or govern against. Yep, absolutely. Yes. So, um, you know, first off, just having a clear understanding what your overall security landscape is, right, is, you know, as, as an example, what are the applications that are being uh, hosted on the cloud environment? What are the users that have access to them, how many users, right? And, and what are the programs and transactions that are being performed around that? So really, you know, really understanding what your landscape is as a step one, and then, you know, understanding, you know, that helps you understand where changes are occurring as an example, right? So, uh, you know, if you have a governance committee and uh, are trying to understand what your landscape is, that's, you know, just a basic, uh, example of what some of those KPIs are. But a, another example is from a sensitive access management perspective, right? Um, you know, what, what does it mean to, uh, to, to, be, to, to, to have sensitive access, right? Uh, are you focused on the application layer? Are you focused on other layers of the, of the IT infrastructure as it relates to your cloud environment? And, uh, and then, you know, how many, uh, as one example, how many employees have access to those sensitive access um, capabilities and is that the right number so one target could be ensuring that only your IT team has access to these very sensitive permissions across your infrastructure right and and so uh, but if as, as as an example you see that uh, you know someone outside of that area does have access uh, to these sensitive permissions, you're able to navigate towards whether things are working correctly or not, um, uh, as you know, one of many examples. So we, 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 you know, we typically help companies and establish there's, there's you know, you, there's a strike, a fine balance of, of key and non-key KPIs, right? And what we find is, you know, there's, there's 30 to 40 key KPIs that you're gonna wanna make sure you monitor uh, or establish a targets and monitor for as you move to the cloud, but also manage your cloud environment from a security risk and threat perspective. Interesting. So it's like what I'm hearing you is almost build. It's like documentation. And I was thinking old terms, right? It's document, got documentation, right? So you've got all of these things that now are moving to the cloud. You have to have a complete understanding of who's accessing, accessing what document that and then measure it you know are they really accessing it you know all all of those things and so there's about 30 as you said 30 kpis that you set up so that you can now have this sort of expectation in place that you're looking at in the clip yep. yeah exactly another example is as you you know as you're requesting access to the cloud environment what are the service level agreements right that you want to ensure that those requests are uh, uh, you know, completed, and if there's you know any misstep in the process, what's the es escalation acceptance for those requests? So establishing those SLAs as another example of a KPI. And you mentioned an interesting concept of the governance committee. And is do you see in your clients cloud governance committees, or are they part of an existing governance committee, or both ways? I, I see it both. Um, 
so I, you know, I, 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 I see it. Don, did you have a perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that a lot of this really revolves around change management within the organization. So it's like, you know, people have been doing things, you know, for as long as their organizations have been in business or as long as they've been within their organization. So a lot of the struggle from a this, this specific question around governance, I think it, if, if organizations and frankly, not a lot of them are very mature in having real governance organizations with, the, you know, kind of the, that proper view, whether it's you know, information governance as well as risk, risk side of things, right? Um, I, I think it, on the ones that do have kind of a more mature program, we see it being assimilated into that mature program, but if they don't really have much of anything, and they're trying to start up something, sometimes it's coalescing kind of the risk side of the cloud piece with, as well as looking kind of the data side of things and helping coalesce. And I would, I would add to that with saying that, you know, we're brought into organizations a lot of times to essentially help with that change management or organizations like Protivity or like us or what have you, to where it's, it's kind of hard to go out to the marketplace and find a lot of these skills, or if you can get them, can you keep them? It's the same kind of comment I made earlier, but it is if you have the right mindset internally and folks that want to embrace and adapt to that change. You know, I think a lot of organizations find an accelerant on bringing in, you know, external help for a time, you know, kind of setting that foundation and then, and then moving it forward. An example I have with that with, a, you know, recently like working with a, a security infrastructure team more on the infrastructure less on the risk and control side of the security but they were just even just getting them familiar with the concept of you know we got stuck in a meeting where they were talking about well we've called this asset for this you know this this database tier or application processing tier we've called it prod why are we giving it these kinds of permissions and i had to stop the conversation and say we just called it prod. We just called it that. It isn't exposed to anything. That endpoint's not visible. It's like what we're doing is, is we're using this as a, a, you know, kind of a mechanism to get everybody used to and accustomed and test out in a very controlled way how it's going to work. And then after we know how it's going to work, we're actually going to destroy all this and we're going to re-represent that as code as infrastructure. So it's fully controlled, fully auditable, and it's actually more controlled than it would have actually been in an on-prem rack and stack type of thing where there's like people literally carrying things around, right? Because yeah, yeah. we've got an auditable, traced, logged way that infrastructure gets managed now. But even just getting people used to that idea, it's a completely foreign concept if you haven't done cloud infrastructure deployment, right? So that's, that's, that's really interesting, Don. So you're saying that you kind of, it, it, it's a different way of spinning off new systems and infrastructure that sometimes people don't understand. So you're like building all the, the audit trails and everything there, right? As you're designing the system and then rolling it out. So you don't have to do this after the fact. And that's a sort of a new and different approach, right? You know, and I don't think people get that from, um, from, from cloud. So that's one, I guess, mindset skill set that, that people need to, to, to have. Wonderful. Well, well, John, Don, thank you both so much for your time today and for your insights. I think this is a great discussion. Um, often you hear just about what the cloud can do and potential, and that's all great and well and good, but now how do you govern it? And, and you guys shared some real examples and insights to, to support our audience in that. So thank you both for your time. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you.